Good morning. Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. If you have a Bible, Hebrews chapter 10. If you did not bring a Bible with you, uh, you can look on your smart device, or if you didn't have that, you can just look up on the screen here. We're going to look at this passage of Scripture. We're walking through the one another's, not all of them, but we're just looking at some of the one another's. Last week, we looked at the first one, love one another. We should love one another. Uh, and today, we're going to talk about encouraging one another. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, I'm going to read out loud, and then we're going to walk through these verses together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new living way through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. God uh, taught me something this week about the one another. So I've never seen this before. Um, the unintended consequences of one another is this, and this is what God showed me this week. The unintended consequences of the one another's is this. What you give, you receive. If you are a lover of one another, if you love other people, they'll love you. Um, if you're ornery to other people, they're going to be ornery to you. Can I get a witness on that? If you're grumpy, they're going to be grumpy. Um, Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And when I was a kid, that verse was held over me like some kind of threat, like a Damocles sword. You know, if you get out of line, God's going to get you. Well, okay, that verse is, that's part of it, is that if whatever you sow uh, wrongly, you'll reap wrongly, but also that verse is teaching whatever you sow rightly, you will reap rightly. And I do believe that the more we practice the one another's, whatever one another we are practicing, diligently, faithfully, consistently, we will receive that in kind as we have given it. So if you are a lover of people, if you love other people, you'll find that other people love you. If you encourage them, you'll find that they encourage you. If you pray for them, you find they pray for you. If you support them, you find they support you. If you bear their burdens, you find that when you have burdens to bear, they'll come alongside of you. Um, how many of you have been to uh, hospital rooms or to visit shut-ins or to uh, to visit uh, someone in the hospital, uh, an assisted living, that you've been to see somebody and you went there to be a blessing and you got a blessing. How many of y'all have experienced that? Okay, I have two. Where you go into a hospital room and you think, you know what, I went over there to be a blessing to somebody and I walked away with a blessing, with a blessing. Now, there's a couple of caveats to what th this principle that God is showing me that what you give, you receive. One of the caveats is that we don't do these things to receive, we do them to give. We don't do this to get, we do this to give. And the second one is that we keep on and we don't keep score. Like we don't sit around and say, you know what, I encouraged 12 people this week and only two people encouraged me, so I'm down 10 encouragements. Somebody owes me 10 encouragements. I prayed for five people and nobody prayed for me, so I'm down five prayers. I, I loved Eight people and one person said they loved me back and so I'm down seven left. That's not the way this thing works. It works that you give the one another's because that's the right thing to do. And in kind, you'll find that as you encourage other people, they'll encourage you. As you love other people, they'll love you. That doesn't happen every single time. But when you consistently do it every single day, all the time, you make it a lifestyle that you'll receive in kind as you have given. 
all of the one another's, I mentioned this last week in, in love one another, but all of the one another's have the uh, uh, linear uh, part of the Greek language that means not just to do that, but to keep on doing that. So we don't just love once in a while, we keep on loving. We don't just encourage once in a while, we keep on encouraging. We keep on doing it all the time, every day for the rest of our lives. That Part of being a follower of Jesus is I'm going to take these one another's that that the New Testament teaches me to do, I'm going to take those and I'm going to put them in my life and I'm going to live my life this way for as long as the Lord lets me be on this earth. I'm going to be an encourager. Now, Vine's Greek dictionary teaches us that the word encouragement is the Greek word paraklesis and is a combination of two words. Para, which means by the side. We, we, we are familiar with the word uh, parallel, by the side. Para, by the side, and kaleo, which means to call. So the word encouragement in the New Testament happens when we come alongside and we call out. We get up next to somebody and we encourage them. Question, do we need encouragement today? Yes, we do. We need to get it and we need to give it. Now, that's not just in the Bible. I came across a couple of um, studies, non-biblical studies. So this is what I'm fixing to share with you is not out of the Bible. It's out of uh, secular research, if you will, non-religious research. Uh, First illustration here, first example I have is Psychology Today. Psychology Today reported the findings of some research done on this very topic, and it was reported in an article for Psychology Today entitled Marriage Math. Marriage Math. In this study, Dr. John Gottman quantified and identified an interesting characteristic of married couples, of happily married couples. Healthy homes enjoy a positive to negative ratio of five to one. In other words, for every one negative comment a spouse makes about their spouse, for every one negative comment, they make five positive comments. For every one comment, negative comment you may make about your siblings, you make five positive comments. For every one comment, negative comment you make about your children, you make five positive comments. And that ratio of five to one is how they define a happy home. This is not a... uh, Theological schools research. This is psychology today. Uh, for every now, on the flip side, for every negative comment or criticism in a unhappy home, for a for every negative comment or criticism, there are five acts works for encouragement, and it's flipped for the other. So, for people whose marriages are not good, whose homes are not good, for every one positive comment, there's five negative ones. So that's psychology today. Here's another one from the Harvard Business Review. A similar study was published in their findings in an article titled The Ideal Praise to Criticism Ratio. Interesting. The Ideal Praise to Criticism Ratio. Their findings concluded that high-performance teams experienced a positive to negative ratio of nearly 6 to 1 that for every one negative comment in the workplace, there's six positive comments. For every one, man, you just messed that up all to pieces. That's just terrible. you got to start over and do it again. For every one of those, there's six. Hey, good job. I like the way you do that. I enjoy working with you. Now, on the flip side, according to this study, low-performing teams had an average of three negative comments to every one positive comment. Encouragement makes a difference in the business world. It makes a difference at work. Um, It makes a difference at home, right? It makes a difference. It makes a difference. Okay, it makes a difference even in this. Like how many people do you know that are negative Nellies, bummer Bobs? You know what I'm saying? They're just, if your name's Nellie or Bob, I'm not talking about you. I'm just using that as an illustration. But how many times have you seen somebody's caller ID come up and you go, Ooh, I like them. Right? And how many of how many times have, have somebody's name come up on your phone and go, voicemail? 
I just don't have the bandwidth to deal with that person today. Because some people just have a way of making you feel better. They're lovers, they're encouragers, and other people just aren't. So we all get this. And it, it's true in the workplace. And it's true at home. Here's another study from a psychologist. He wrote a, a book about this. And one of his quotes was this, quote, People have a way of becoming what you encourage them to be, not what you nag them to be. Can I get an amen on that? People tend to become what you encourage them to become, not what you nag them to become. Now, I put in my notes, I put it in my notes, don't mention COVID today, but I need to. The COVID debate has been, in my view, the COVID debate has been the medical versus the political. Is this real? How bad is it? How much of this is motivated by politics? So let me just tell you, has, has a lot of this been motivated by politics and all God's people said? Is COVID real and all God's people said? Yes. I've had it. Tracy's had it. My daughter-in-law has it right now. Tracy and I went and got tested yesterday because we were with Kayla last week. And we got tested and both of us yesterday are fine. So we're good. You can get around me and we're, we're good to go. But COVID is real. What we can't do is put a dollar value on COVID. Like we cannot quantify how much medically in the United States has COVID cost in a year and a half. Trillions of dollars. I mean, we know it's a lot of money. How much political ill will has been spread in the United States over COVID and how much of that, if it could be uh, quantified with a dollar amount. So let's say the medical versus the political. Let's say if you took just the medical part of this and the political part of this and you put a number on it and you said, okay, this is what this has cost us in the United States. Let me just throw a number out there. I have no data for this. I'm just, I'm just showing you an illustration. Let's say that that has cost us $2 trillion of in, in the economy. I'm just pulling a number out. Here's the discussion that I don't think uh, happens enough. That greater than the medical cost, greater than the political cost, is the relational cost and the spiritual cost. The relationships that have been damaged. Understand this. God wants us together. He wants us doing the one another's. God wants us in community. Satan wants us in isolation. Because if he can get all of us set, spread out from each other, either angry with each other or disagreeing with each other, or we can't even be together with our families, our friends, our coworkers, our, our, the people that we like, our church member friends, the people we like hanging out with. If, if the devil can separate you out from the herd and then start working on your mind and get in your hair, between your ears, the damage that is done to relationships and the damage that is done spiritually to people's spiritual condition. And I believe this. I believe this. Whatever number you want to put to, on this. If you say that the medical and the political cost of COVID has been $2 trillion, I would suggest to you that the religious and the, relation, the relationship cost and the spiritual cost of COVID has been $20 trillion. I think it's been much greater than the actual medical cost of COVID. What it has done to our relationships and what it has done to our spiritual walk and our spiritual depression and discouragement and all the stuff that people are dealing with now that has nothing to do with politics and it has nothing to do with medical stuff. It's, it's here. And it's here. Now, the words, up, I highlighted them three times up here. Let us, let us, let us. Let implies allowance and us implies alliance. He didn't say you should. He said let us. Not you ought to, but let us. Let us. So I want to look at the three let us is here. So let us. So maybe by the time I'm done with this, you're going to want a lettuce salad for lunch. Let us. Let us. You get that? I just throw them out, folks. You take the ones you like, you throw the rest back. That's fine. So there's three let us's here. Let us draw near, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, 
with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. If you are an Old Testament student of Scripture, what you find in the Old Testament is quite often, especially around um, the book of Exodus and then the tabernacle, you find uh, that they were to stay away from God. Like, God was up on the mountain. Moses went up on the mountain to meet with God. There was a time where God would reveal himself and people would turn their back so that they didn't have to see God because they weren't supposed to. And then the, the, uh, the, the uh, Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go in once a year to sacrifice for the sins of the people, but nobody else was allowed to go in. And what happened in the New Testament when Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus said, it is finished, and when that happened, the Bible says the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom, not bottom to top. Bottom to top is man-made. Top to bottom is God-made. And what happened when that, the veil of the temple was ripped, now it's not stay away. Now it's draw near. See, now we can be close to God. We can, we can crawl up in God's lap. We can talk to him any place, any time about anything. So he says to us in verse 22, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. So you can draw near to God through Jesus Christ. The second one is let us hold fast. Let us hold on or hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. Let us hold fast or hold on. The reformers call this the perseverance of the saints. This is the human side of salvation. We hold fast not to be saved, but because we are. This is important. We hold on, verse 23. Let us hold on to this confession. This is not saying we have to hang on to this to be saved. That's not what it's saying. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope. This hope we have in Christ, you need to hang on to that. Not in order to be saved, but because you are. Um, it's like if you're, again, I used it earlier, but it, like if you're married, right? um, every morning, I'm not patting myself, I'm just telling you something here. You can take, I'm, I'm not, every morning I take Tracy coffee because it takes her longer to get ready than me and it's just because she has hair and I don't. <laughs> so we get up in the morning, I start the coffee, I make it the night before, I start the coffee when it's ready, I take it into the bathroom and give her her cup, I take my cup and we start going about our day. I don't do that because it says in some marriage contract you have to take her coffee or your contract is null and void. I don't do that to stay married. I do that because we are. You, when you love people, you want to do stuff for them. And that's, what this, that's really what this is talking about. So not only should we draw near with a true heart, but to hold on to this confession of our hope for he who promised is faithful. It's not my faithfulness that's at stake here. It's his faithfulness. So he has promised he is faithful. So I'm going to hold on to that confession. I'm going to hold on to that faithfulness of God that he has given me through the person of Jesus Christ. The third one is let us consider one another in order to provoke one another to good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Two, two interesting words here. There's the word provoke, verse 24, which means to stimulate, to sharpen or incite. And the second one is the word encourage. So not neglecting the gathering together. Think with me. Think with me. Not neglecting to gather together. Gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. Question. Can we, the answer is yes. In case you know. Can we encourage each other on Zoom? Yes. Can we encourage each other on FaceTime? Yes. We can. It's not the same. It's not the same. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because y'all are here. Um, I understand their extenuating circumstances. I understand that some folks cannot yet go back into a building to, to worship. And we, for, for a long time, when, when COVID first hit, 
all we could do was like daily devotionals. We'd send them out to you guys on Facebook. And we did 178 of those in about three months, just about five or six days a week. We were sending stuff out. And it wasn't the same, but it was all we could do. And I understand for some folks it's all they can do. But that's never been God's plan. And I think it's fascinating. When we look at the Bible that was written hundreds, the New Testament was written hundreds of years ago. And we read verse 25, not neglecting to gather together, comma, as some are in the habit of doing, comma, but encouraging each other. Now think about where we are now. Like, think about where we are today. Take out for just a second, as some are in the habit of doing, and just put the first phrase and the third phrase together. Not neglecting to gather together, but encouraging each other. Here's what I believe this is teaching. That in order for us to truly encourage each other, we have to gather together. And I think it's fascinating that 1,700 years ago, 1,800 years ago, 1,900 years ago, this was written. Before COVID, before Zoom, before FaceTime. Doesn't that kind of read like the paper? Don't neglect to gather together. Doesn't that kind of read like the news? Because there are people neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing. There are people who used to be faithful attenders of church, participants in the worship service, that now it's once in a blue moon. They have created new habits, and they're not healthy ones. I believe what God is saying here is you don't neglect to gather together to encourage each other. If you want to truly encourage each other, you have to get together. That's what he's saying. But to encourage each other to get together, something happens when you get God's people in the same room at the same time. What Zoom gives you is two of the five senses. You have sight and you have sound. You don't have taste, which I don't want us tasting each other (laughs) or smelling each other. But there's something happens when we come in this room and we see our, our brothers and sisters in Christ and we shake their hands and we hug their necks and we pat them on the back and we see their eyes this close and not through a screen. How many of y'all have had virtual doctor's exams? through this. I had a virtual doctor's exam because I thought it, I thought I had COVID. So he said, like, I'm, I'm, this is the dumbest thing. I'm, I'm looking into my computer screen and he's looking into his computer screen. No, it wasn't COVID. It was, I was having a problem with my nose. And so the doctor says, okay, let me see inside your nose. <laughs> okay. So I'm like, Let me see your, your throat. He diagnosed me incorrectly. So then I went over to Dr. Gatledge's office, and he diagnosed me properly. That's the difference. It's not the same. Something happens when you're in the same room with the same people worshiping our God and fellowshipping with one another that cannot happen any other way. Can't happen any other way. And I, I understand sometimes this is the best option for people, but if we want to encourage each other, we're going to have to be together to do it. We can do it on phone, we can do FaceTime, we can do Zoom, we can do phone calls, but it's not the same as actually spending some serious, good time together. Now, I want to give you two or three just kind of bullet point takeaways on how we can encourage one another. How do we encourage each other? What are some like, what I'm fixing to tell you is if you went to Barnes and Nobles and bought a book with this stuff in it, you'd pay $25.99 for this. And I'm going to give it to you for free. This is really good stuff. So I want to give you two or three things about how we can encourage one another. Ready? Number one, point out what you appreciate about them and tell them. Look for positive things to say 
about the person you're trying to encourage. Let me give you a a help here. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything virtuous about that or praiseworthy, think about those things. That's how we should think, but that's also how we can encourage one another. If you don't know how to encourage somebody else, look at that list. What about them is pure? What about them is honorable, is just, is true, is lovely, is commendable? And tell them. Don't assume people know. Everybody, I'm telling you folks, I'm a pastor. I do this for a living. I do this all the time. There are a lot of people emotionally and spiritually hanging on by a thread right now. And they could really use somebody to pat them on the back and say, you know what, I just want to encourage you because I really like you. I think you're just the best. Everybody needs that encouragement. Now, remember, it has to be sincere and genuine. It doesn't work if it's not sincere and genuine. Now, I've, I've seen parents do this. Where your kids get in a fight, your little kids, they get in a fight, right? So you go and you break up the fight and you say something like, we don't do that here in this house. We love each other. So hug your sister and tell her you love her. And then you see these two little tense bodies go toward each other like they're going to have to eat liver. And they're hugging each other going, I love you, I love you. Do they mean that? No. Do they mean that? No. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that kind of encouragement. I'm not talking about you leaving here today and and say to your your friend or your spouse or your parents, uh, hey, did a good job on dinner last night. And you didn't mean it. Like, it's got to be sincere. So I want to challenge you to find somebody in your life that needs encouragement and look for something positive to say about them and say it to them. You know what? I'm so glad you're in my life. I am so glad you're in my life. I'm glad we work together. I really enjoy coming to work and doing stuff with you. I can't imagine. I told Trace yesterday, I said, I can't imagine my life without you in it. Like, I just can't imagine. So... Point out what you appreciate about them and tell them. Okay, number two, hold back unnecessary criticism. Hold back unnecessary criticism. Watch this. This is not good. Don't do this. Okay, encouragement. Whatever you're going to say, okay, you're going to encourage somebody. So here's encouragement, comma, but... You just killed it. You just killed the deal. Or encouragement, semicolon. However, (laughs) you don't have to tell that person everything you think about that person. They need encouragement. I know people personally who have said to me that they have a discerning spirit. And so they are very critical of people. But they say, well, you know, this is a discerning spirit. Well, yeah, maybe you do, but that doesn't mean you need to go around blessing people with it. People don't need to hear that. And by the way, I think people with discerning spirits, are, people that have a discerning spirit, they're not unkind people. Just because you know, look, I'm not saying go find a perfect person that has no problems and encourage them. We all have problems. I got baggage, people. I'm not that good a person. John Baker is not. That. I mean, I'm okay, but I mean, I'm not, a, I, I'm not Hitler or anything, but I'm not that great. But I don't, when I need encouragement, I don't need you to come up and say, well, John, that was a good sermon last Sunday, but most of the time they're not. See what I'm saying? Or, hey, 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 uh, John, I really appreciate this. However, I don't like this and this and this and this and this. Does that make sense? So when you're looking to encourage somebody, just encourage them and drop it. 
You don't need to tell them what you don't like about them. They, they already feel bad enough. Encourage them and don't be negative. Let me give you one more. Encourage them for their sake, not yours. There is a fine line between manipulation and motivation. Sometimes I have been encouraged by a boss, by a coworker, by someone, a family member. I have been encouraged on occasion when I felt somehow manipulated. You know what I mean? Have you ever felt manipulated? Somebody's just, and you feel like, I'm not, I'm being worked here. I'm, this is, I'm not comfortable with this. The difference between motivation and manipulation is when I'm encouraging you because I want to encourage you and I want you to be everything God made you to be, that is motivation. When I am encouraging you because I need you to do something for me down the road, that's manipulation. And it's completely different. So I would encourage you, if you want to... I would encourage you, that's funny. I didn't just realize what I said. I want to challenge you that if you want to be an encourager, number one... Find somebody and point out what you truly, genuinely appreciate about them. Don't slam them in the process of complimenting them. And make sure that your motivation to encourage them is pure, that you just want to encourage that person because they desperately need it. And to be honest with you, all of us could use some encouragement. And I don't mean once in a blue moon. I mean all the time, every day. I want to challenge you to become an encourager. To understand one word, one saying, change your life. When I was um, 10, 12 years old, my father's best friend, I called him Uncle Howard. He wasn't my uncle. He was my father's best friend. He was a godly man. He was a good dude, man. Uncle Howard was everything a pastor should be. He was. And when I was about 10 or so, he knew that I was wanted to be a pastor one day. I told him. And he gave me a book, a little notebook, to journal stuff in. And he gave me a word of encouragement about this. He just pulled me alongside. We were in the kitchen. I'll never forget, we were in the kitchen in our house, and he handed me this notebook, and he just kind of pulled me up to his side, and he whispered an encouraging word in my ear. Uncle Howard's been with the Lord for 40 years now. But I'm telling you, Howard Merritt, Uncle Howard, changed the life of a kid when he pulled me up next to him and he whispered a pure word of encouragement in the ear of a kid. A kid. I was just a kid. He changed my life. He changed the course of my life. I wanted to be a pastor like Uncle Howard. He could have just said, ah, kid, you know, I don't need to. He went out of his way to encourage a 10-year-old kid, and it changed my life. You never know, you never know what a kind word will do for somebody. It may, be a, it may be a turning point in their life and you don't even know it and you just feel impressed to say something to them. Just say it. Say it. It may change their life. How cool would it be to get to heaven and realize you changed some lives and you didn't even know you did it? On occasion, I've run into people who like 30 years ago would say, you know, you said this to me. And I don't remember saying it to them. And they said, you know what? I've, I've had people tell me, you said this to me, and it really, you have no idea how I, that, that changed my life. And I don't, to this day, remember saying it. But they remember hearing it. So you never know. Let's, let's, let's agree to partner together that we're going to be a church filled with encouragers that encourage people here and we encourage people out there. When you go to work and you're dealing with the problems of the office, be an encourager. When you go to school tomorrow and you're going back to class and you're seeing these new friends and old friends, be an encourager. When you walk out to pick up the paper or get the mail and you see your neighbor in their yard, go over and be an encourager. You never know. 
You may change a life by just speaking a kind word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Uncle Howard. Thank you for Dr. Davis. Thank you for my brother-in-law, Jim. Thank you for my in-laws. Thank you for all the men and women in my life that have encouraged me along the way. And they have no idea how they changed my life, how they impacted me in a positive way, how they kept me going in the right direction. And I'm grateful for them. Lord, help me to be an encourager. Help us all to encourage everyone we can, knowing that everybody these days needs some encouragement. So, Lord, whether it's the person that brings our mail to the house and we have a chance to say something to them, we just happen to catch them in the mailbox, or maybe somebody at the bank or somebody at the gas station or somebody at work, help us, Lord, to look for opportunities to be kind and to be encouraging to our fellow man. In Jesus' name.